Good afternoon. I'm Marcy Glazer, CEO of the JCCSF and the host of today's event. With the JCC closed to in-person activity, we are excited to continue our tradition of bringing thinkers, artists, intellectuals, and public figures from across the cultural landscape into community with San Francisco. Today's program is an opportunity to hear directly from San Francisco Mayor London Breed and Dr. Warren Browner, CEO, Sutter Health, CPMC, about how our city and medical communities are handling the COVID-19 public health crisis. And there's gonna be an opportunity for you to share your questions and concerns. Many thanks to our donors and stakeholders who have stepped forward to lend financial support to us, some of whose names I see on this participant list. Literally, we cannot weather this crisis without you. Thank you. And to all of those on this call, we know that you are experiencing all sorts of anxiety and personal impacts from this crisis. We know that some of these, this conversation could be difficult and we thank you for participating in whatever form you can. And now to our, our panelists. Mayor London Breed is the 45th mayor of, of the city and county of San Francisco and the first African-American woman mayor in the city's history. She's a native San Franciscan, raised by her grandmother in public housing in the Western Edition. And prior to her political career, she was executive director of the African-American Art and Cultural Complex and has been recognized rightfully internationally for her leadership and forward thinking response during this pandemic. Dr. Warren Browner has served as CEO of Sutter Health CPMC since 2009. Prior to joining CPMC, he was a faculty member at UCSF for 15 years and Chief of General Internal Medicine at the San Francisco VA Medical Center. He's a board certified internist and professor of epidemiology and biostatistics at UCSF. His medical degree is from UCSF. He has a master's degree in public health and epidemiology from UC Berkeley. Welcome Mayor Breed and Dr. Browner. Thank you so much for joining us. And let's start off the program with a few words from each of you about what you're thinking about and facing at this stage in the crisis. Mayor Breed. First of all, I wanna say thank you to the JCC for hosting this opportunity. Excited to be here with Dr. Browner and uh, to talk about uh, the challenges that continue to uh, shape how uh, our new normal uh, will be because we know that COVID-19 will be with us for some time. And right now my focus of course is yes, I want to protect public health and continue to make the right decisions based on the science, based on the data. Uh, but we also understand that there's another uh, crisis that is brewing, and that is a financial crisis, especially for very low income residents. We know the JCC even has had to furlough a number of employees, and, and I know that you've been able to hold on to as many people as you possibly can. Uh, but this is something, sadly, that's impacting uh, small businesses and people all over San Francisco where. Uh, they don't know where their next paycheck is going to come from. And we have a responsibility to make sure that in balancing public health, we also remember that the impacts financially on people's lives and their ability to take care of themselves creates also another public health challenge. Uh, so that has really been at the top of um, my, my thoughts. And in more specific, uh, I just announced yesterday that we will be allowing retail to occur uh, for pickup and delivery at all of the businesses that have storefronts uh, that are on the street, that are close to the street. Um, that's one step further towards getting our economy going, but this is gonna be a rough time for all of us. And uh, this, uh, Dr. Browner probably knows more about the science and the data and how all that stuff works. Um, I know uh, my, my director of the Department of Public Health, Dr. Grant Colfax, he's, he's amazing, but we've, we, we are on the phone almost, you know, on a regular basis, you know, I'm basically saying, but I need this. And he's explaining to me why this can't happen. And ultimately um, we need more to happen and we need to make some changes and get to a better place because uh, this is definitely taking its toll on a lot of folks, uh, not just here in the San Francisco, but in our country. Uh, but we want to make sure we do so responsibly. And so that's really my focus. Thanks. Dr. Browner? 
Well, thank you, Marcy, for inviting me, and thank you, Mayor Reed, for joining us. Um, and thank you, everybody on the call, because you've been the most critical element thus far in the response to the pandemic, because when we asked you to stay home, you did. And that really helped us, on behalf of all the hospitals in the city, prevent the big surge that we were all worried about and that we saw happen in other places like Italy and in New York. Um, you've been sheltering in place and you've been practicing distancing and thank you for that. And I wanna thank the mayor and the Department of Public Health for taking the lead and putting San Francisco into the vanguard of American cities and really putting in place the right policies. That surge would have overwhelmed us and it didn't. And importantly, we now know that if we ever need to shelter in place again because the surge is coming, we know how to do it and we know it will work. So we're much better prepared. All the hospitals now have the necessary equipment. We have the necessary policies and procedures. Our staff are trained and they're frankly more confident in our ability to handle what's coming next. Now, I know to some of you, it may seem like San Francisco's hospitals compete with one another, maybe especially during open enrollment when we're advertising all the time. But let me assure you that we work together with the Department of Public Health incredibly cooperatively, meeting several times a week to plan a coordinated response to protect the people of San Francisco ever since the mayor declared the emergency. So now our job, now that the peak has passed, is a little bit different. And with apologies to those of you whose calculus is a little rusty or maybe non-existent, our new job is to reduce the area under the COVID curve. And what do I mean by that? That's reducing the number of people who get infected, the number of those who become ill and need to be hospitalized, and especially the number who succumb to COVID-19. We're all literally working 24 seven to make this happen while at the same time opening our hospitals. And we're gonna need all of your help to continue to protect this city and the rest of the Bay Area. So thank you. Thank you. Mayor Breed, one of the, the primary areas of questions has been how San Francisco is protecting those who are the most vulnerable. And we have a number of questions about um, people experiencing homelessness, about um, what their experience is, how we might support them, um, and, and the continuation of a conversation that we've been in, you know, what do you want to do about tents on the sidewalk and encampments after shelter in place is gone? How, this is a, 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 an issue that has been with us before the pandemic that has been exacerbated by the pandemic and wanted to give you a chance to address that. Well, um, as you know, addressing homelessness for many major cities in the U.S. has not been easy. Um, I think, of course, it has a lot to do with the fact that we have not only uh, not built enough housing, uh, but we also have not addressed uh, the challenges around mental health and substance abuse in a way that actually gets to a place where we not only have the system and the programs and the support, but we're able to combine that with really force uh, to get people into treatment, uh, to get them into our mental health hospitals so that they can get the support that they need. So there's a lot of missing pieces to this, this conversation, but ultimately um, what we have done uh, in leasing up a number of hotel rooms, uh, we have been able to help over a thousand people. We first, of course, had to thin out our shelter system where we know uh, people were most at risk of, of contracting COVID-19. Um, and we, have of course, in the process of doing that, have been met with many challenges. And when I say many challenges, uh, staffing, uh, resources, um, PPE is still continues to be a problem. I think Dr. Browner will tell you even with our hospital systems. Uh, and ultimately, if you think about how challenging it was before, just imagine how challenging it is now that we're asking city workers and healthcare professionals and uh, nonprofit employees to now, in the age of social distancing, work with a population that was already very challenging to work with to begin with. Uh, so something as simple as asking somebody to wear a mask turns into a whole episode. 
or not to ride the elevator more than what we have a hotel room in particular that could house over 400 people and because of a number of challenges we continue to face in this hotel we've not been able to allow the capacity to go more than 200 we just can't handle it uh, so it's it's very complicated and the issues that existed before the pandemic don't just go away uh, but i think for the most part uh, under the circumstances, uh, compared to other cities, San Francisco has done as well as we could, and we're continuing to work hard every single day uh, to responsibly get as many hotels as we can so that the people we're allowing to be in those hotel rooms are safe, the staff and the folks who are there to serve them, both from the hotel and the nonprofit and the city side are safe. Uh, it takes a lot of work. As it relates to the tent encampments in particular, um, our strategy is such that we are following the CDC guidelines. They have asked us uh, to not necessarily remove any tents, but you know, here's some of the good news. It's not the perfect solution, but uh, there was an informal tent uh, encampment at a park in the Bayview Hunters Point community. As we speak, ever since yesterday, we have been moving each of those persons one by one out of their tent into trailers at Pier uh, 94. Uh, and we got 120 trailers. We have staff, we have support, we have resources. Uh, and so that transition is happening as we speak. The encampment in Fulton Street, we put up barriers, we separated the tents out, and we are case managing each person um, within those encampments. And I wanna be clear, a couple of things are gonna have to happen. Number one, we're gonna work within the system that we have to work within and try and provide the level of support necessary. But more importantly, I have made it clear, for those of you who have not, for, for those of people who were not in our system of care before this pandemic, they are not gonna cut the line uh, to get housing or a hotel or into any system over someone else who has been on the wait list for a very long time to get assistance. We have to draw the line somewhere. We are not gonna be able to help everyone. It continues to be a work in prog progress. Uh, and the goal is to start looking at transitional plans now. And the hope is that in some cases, we'll be able to have access uh, long-term to some of these hotel rooms, especially because we know uh, conventions and tourism and other things, they're just not gonna magically reappear. Uh, so we are working on long -term, short term and long term strategies. Uh, it has not been easy, uh, but we, we will continue to do the very best we can. Dr. Browner, I know homelessness is, uh, has been an issue for hospitals as well. Um, any thoughts on it? Yeah, hospitals throughout uh, urban America have been dealing with homelessness because of course, when the homeless get sick or ill that's where, or injured, that's where uh, they come. I will say, um, I wish homelessness was just about finding shelter, um, a roof over someone's head. Uh, there are a lot of other lessnesses, if you will, besides just missing a home. People who are homeless are missing, obviously, uh, funds. They're missing social supports. They're missing friends and family to take them in. They suffer from physical and behavioral issues and substance use. They're incredibly challenging people to take care of, incredibly challenging patients for all of us to take care of. And what COVID-19 has done is just exposed how terrible this problem really has become. Um, and I think it is important to understand that we're not gonna solve the COVID-19 pandemic in San Francisco or anywhere until we at least come up with some temporary solutions to addressing people who are, who are homeless. Um, hospitals are certainly doing our part. The city is doing its part. Um, the city's uh, residents, I think, are gonna have to also do our part. We may have to get a little tougher on some of the behaviors that we've tolerated for many years because we're a city that tolerates behavior. That's, that's our national reputation. Um, I'm concerned, for example, about making sure that people who aren't sheltered are at least masked to protect um, their fellow homeless uh, encamp people as well as the rest of the city. So there's a lot more work to be done um, in our vulnerable populations. The homeless are just the most obvious for us. So you're each dealing with 
tremendous life and death decisions and with um, in, in many cases ones that were not expected to be on your uh, on your agenda when you entered your your positions um, and and mental health is is top of mind for all of us as we deal with kids at home or solitude or a combination of lots of things how are you personally um, dealing with the stress and uncertainty that, that comes with this uh, and through leading Mary? What was that last part, Andrew? And, and, and not just the stress and uncertainty of your own experience, but having to manage your own experience within the framework of leading, yeah. leading the city of San Francisco, being on, um, uh, you know, be having a press conference every day, every week, <laughs> on topics that mean everything to uh, the livelihoods of your constituents. It's a heavy burden. Yeah, I, I will say that it, it's, it takes its toll. Uh, the work is not, the, the challenge for me is just somewhat of the isolation and not being able to go to dinner and hang out with friends or even go to events. I'm dying to go to anybody's event if I can. And so the interaction that you get from being around people um, every single day, that is, I think, somewhat taking its toll. You know, it, it just, um, I'm, I'm happy to be able to go out anytime I'm given the opportunity. Most of the time, uh, my staff, they are focused on allowing me to go to Moscone Center where we have the Emergency Operations Center for press conferences. Um, they want to make sure that I stay away from people because they don't want me to contract the virus, of course. And so uh, we have to be very careful and I also have to set the example. Um, but it, for the most part, I'm getting rest, I'm exercising, I'm trying to eat healthy. I mean, that is the hardest part because um, you know, what else do you have to do other than <laughs> Zoom calls, phone calls, and making decisions, of course, but then you're home and there's the refrigerator, it's there all day. Um, so it's, it's, it's tough. And I think that the, what I realize is, you know, of course, I'm not alone. And y even though there is a responsibility here, uh, everyone out there is experiencing the same thing. I actually feel really bad for people who have children. Um, and just to have, like my sister was saying, my nephew was crying because he saw the slide and he couldn't get on the slide. And, and, and just hearing stories like that about children who are just having a tough time, that's what I worry about the most. And also seniors who are in isolation, where already oftentimes, for example, Laguna Honda is a perfect example. We had to stop visitation there because of um, a number of people who contracted the virus. And uh, and just think about it, those, those folks have, they look forward to those visits because they don't happen very often sometimes. So I think part of it is, um, what, what weighs I think heavy on my heart is the desire to want to um, be able to take care of the people who, who need us to take care of them the most, um, including the small businesses and the, the hairdressers and the barbershops who basically make absolutely no money if they're not working. And so those are the things I think about. Uh, I try to take a moment in the day to be, to meditate and to not focus so much on COVID, like every conversation and even with some of my friends, I'm like, if we have a happy hour, no COVID talk, you know, um, to just separate myself from this. But it is also hard to because this is our new normal and uh, it, it, it's tough. And I do think that it's definitely starting to take its toll on a lot of people, which is why I'm, you know, being really pushy with our doctors on you know, giving us a little bit more wiggle room to, to see if some things work, especially because the numbers uh, give us the flexibility to do that. Dr. Browner? Yeah, no, um, in a very strange way, I feel very lucky that I get to go to work every day. Um, that's something to do that I know most people um, who are staying home all the time don't get even out of the house as, on a regular basis. So I feel lucky about that. Um, I will tell you the beginning of the epidemic was really hard. Um, very early on, we spoke with colleagues in China, in Wuhan, and right in the middle of the pandemic there, and heard about what was going on and heard about what was likely to happen you know, in San Francisco, and came to realize pretty quickly who was most vulnerable. Um, and I fit a bunch of the categories, of, personally, of people who were vulnerable if we got infected. 
And then we had an experience, I had an experience where a colleague in the hospital um, was infected with COVID-19 and very, very ill, was in our intensive care unit for more than two weeks on a ventilator. <clears throat> and every day I'd come to work and uh, check up on him as best I could without violating his privacy. And he was still in the ICU and still on a ventilator. And, and um, it was really tough. And then one day I came in and saw that he, uh, his team was planning to remove him from the ventilator and get him ready to go to the floor, to, to a reg plain old regular hospital bed. Um, and when I saw that he'd been transferred, I texted him and um, five minutes later, he called back and um, I literally broke down. I mean, you can hear it in my voice now. Um, recognizing that he was still alive. Um, so it's been hard. And, um, and I think that's part of what makes it so hard for all of us is realizing our own tremendous vulnerability to this virus. And as much as all of us want to see our friends, um, I think we all realize, especially, especially those of us over 65, never mind those over 70 or 80, who I imagine are a fair number of the people watching or, or listening to us tonight. Um, this is not a good disease to get. We don't yet have um, cures. We're working on them, but, but we're not there. And staying safe is still the order of the day for all of us. So it's a good transition in that one of the, we're, we're getting, as you might imagine, from an audience that is convened by the JCC, which, you know, has a 400 family preschool and is a place where literally thousands of San Franciscans learn to swim. The focus of, of uh, um, a number of questions is about what does this mean for kids? What does this mean as we look into the fall for going back to school? And what does this mean in how we do that equitably, such that um, everybody is going to be able to get an education, um, not just those who you know, are in the most affluent areas or, or have access to the most resources? Mary Breed? I was going to say, doctor, <laughs> <laughs> I'm waiting. I have some um, thoughts. Let me, let me, I'll just say that, you know, I'm not the doctor, but I am the advocate because like, I, I know what kind of kid I was and I just can't help but think about how I would have drove my grandmother even more crazy if I were a kid at this time during a pandemic. Yeah. And uh, I also think about, you know, the fact that, um, kids they need this they need to be able to connect with one another and you know for example i heard about a camp that uh said you know we'll have summer camp but your kid's gonna have to wear a mask i mean i i'm i'm struggling with how is that gonna work for kids who are just out there being kids and playing with one another and spending time with one another and i i think that the doctors are gonna have to to figure this out because uh, the fact is, people need to get back to work. Parents need childcare. They need these summer camps. Uh, the school system is is looking at what's going to happen in the fall. And the reality is, we're just getting computers and access to internet to all the students now, even though distance learning has already been going on for some time. Uh, and so, I, I think that uh, there's a real challenge here, and there's a real challenge in that you know, COVID nineteen is going to be with us for the next probably almost two years. And the question is, how do we adjust in a way that's safe, but also that's realistic for the, the various people and populations? And, and, and my push and my fight, of course, is for the um, rec and park to be available so that families, I mean, right now we're doing emergency childcare at rec and park with, you know, our healthcare providers and some of our city employees can have a place for their kids to go. Well, we're trying with social distancing and we're keeping kids separately, but when they're around each other a little bit, sometimes they may not always do that. But so, so I think we're going to need to uh, we're looking at the numbers. Everything is contingent upon where we are. And the good news is, for example, um, we're at 1,999 today in San Francisco. 
and we've had 35 people, sadly, uh, who passed away. Um, our hospitalizations are down uh, for the first time, but you know, we still, we have about 65 people hospitalized and 25 people in the ICU. And that's the first time we really saw that number go down. So I was like, yes. And ultimately we want things to go down, which I think would, you know, be encouraging for our medical professionals to give us the green light to do more, to allow uh, the things that we need the most for kids to begin to open up. And people want certainty and I completely get it. Uh, but sadly, this has been an evolving situation where the answer to your question could be one thing today and then tomorrow it could be something completely different. Uh, and I have relied on the guidance of our healthcare professionals to help in making those decisions. Uh, but I've also been really aggressive in wanting people to get back to work and wanting kids to get back to school, but again, putting safety first. So uh, Dr. Browner, when are we gonna be able to, you know- uh, Help us out, Dr. Warner, <laughs> Dr. Browner. <laughs> When are, we, when are we going to be able to get rid of our kids? I mean, uh, take our kids to childcare and do all the things that, you know, we did once before in a responsible way. So let me give you a few thoughts on this. Um, you know, the first phase of the epidemic has been in um, congregate living situations. So we've probably all forgotten, but it started in cruise ships, at least as it affected us. Um, well, 12 million Americans take cruises every year. I think we have that covered because I don't think any of us are getting on a cruise ship anytime soon. And then about a half, there's a half a million homeless people, a million and a half or so people who live in skilled nursing facilities, two and a half million who are in jails. Those are really high risk populations. But if you want to know what keeps me up at night, there are 76 million students in the United States from kindergarten through um, college and university. And that's the next, I mean, obviously we've taken them away from their congregate settings. They're now home and isolated, but the decision to put them back is a gigantic decision. It makes the little bit of opening that we've been able to do uh, really a, a very small amount. So I know kids aren't gonna like this answer and parents maybe not, but it's gonna be a while and uh, masks and washing your hands multiple times during the day, spreading kids out in the, in the classroom, not having lunch in the cafeteria or, or having assemblies. Um, those are all gonna be part of the new normal for schools. Or what's gonna happen, unfortunately, is kids are gonna get infected and they're gonna bring it home to their parents and grandparents and we're gonna refill the hospitals. So. It's going gonna, it's gonna to take a major, major effort um, to, to uh, get back to normal when it comes to children in school. And I think you heard that from uh, Dr. Fauci when he <clears throat> testified um, to Congress about his reluctance to give a date, because I think he understands what a gigantic decision that's going to be. Well, gathering, there's, there's a number of questions about how we think about emerging, as you're saying, Dr. Browner, from our homes where, um, uh, you know, with great leadership, Mayor Breed had a stay at home um, and we've seen the results of that, but we're now are emerging into some version of, a, of public spaces. Um, you know, the JCC and, and other organizations like us would, would like to be exemplary partners as we move through the remainder of this year and as we think about continuing to build community. And what can you tell us about how to move through this uncertain recovery time? Um, Let me, and I, you know, I think it leads also into the questions about what's the role of testing? All right, let me, let me, let me start with that. So first, uh, the good news is outdoors, outside. Um, fresh air, UV light during the day, lots of space, fewer surfaces, fewer things to touch. It's a great place to get together with friends, maintaining social distancing and masks. Um, and I, I really think we need to do more of that and get used to that. You know, I think we're all used to meeting friends in a restaurant or having friends over for dinner. Um, picnics have to become the new norm. Um, 
I mean, I, hey, picnic with social distancing because we don't want any social problems distancing. at the parks. <laughs> yes, and at, um, Molly and I um, uh, try to exercise in the park every day, and we've seen that actually. People spreading out where everybody brings their own blanket and they sit six feet apart um, and and reunite with their friends. So I think that's first. Um, I have an idea um, for somebody who wants to be the first person to build a water bottle that has built in a gel dispenser so that you can um, enjoy the outdoors, have your water, and then clean your hands just in case. So I think that's the first thing is we need to do a lot more outdoor activity. Um, but that's first of all. Second, I've been using, I'm sure everybody in the call has heard of the paleo diet, you know, which is the foods we're supposed to have eaten when we were uh, evolving as human beings. Well, I do want to remind people that uh, we may have to go to a, a paleo style of, of interacting as well. We weren't really supposed to interact with hundreds of people, different people a day. We evolved to interact probably with 100 or 150 people in our lifetime. And so reducing the number of random encounters with strangers whom you don't know and don't know what they've been doing, I think is going to be part of our new paleo lifestyle for quite a while. Um, and, and so I think controlling the number of people you interact with and being very careful with them is going to enable us to open up more. It's not going to be the same the way it used to be, but it's going to be a lot better than just interacting with one or two people, whoever happens to be in your household unit, or even for many people, just themselves, because many people, of course, are in a household of one. Um, so summarizing outdoors, distancing, masking, and being very careful about what you do. Mayor Breed, you're, you're, uh, you're trying to help us reopen the city um, and, and get people back on their feet, get small businesses back on their feet, and mm -hmm. you just announced the the expansion of uh, opportunity for retail to, to curbside. Yeah. Um, can you tell us a little bit about, about that decision, what impact you expect that to have, and, and what role testing might be, might be playing for the, the businesses and sectors that you are considering reopening? So I, I think what we're looking at, there are, certain, there are six indicators, and I hope I can remember them all. Um, I was just looking for them in my slide. But um, specifically, we, the, the Department of Public Health, they're looking at these six indicators. Testing is definitely um, one of them, and we need to be able to at least administer 1,600 tests at least per day, and we are almost there, and I believe we will probably be there next week. Um, the other side of that is we're expanding testing in a way that pharmacies will be allowed to do testing and other places. So we wanna make it accessible. We wanna make it easy and accessible because again, COVID-19 will be with us. So testing is gonna play a critical role uh, to our ability to make sure that uh, people are able to get out there because think about it. I mean, you could get tested today and be negative, And then two days later, you could test again and be positive. Like this is one test does not mean that it's over for you. So this is with us and we need to be mindful of that. Uh, contact tracing is also really important and making sure that once we identify someone who's positive, that we're able to identify not just their immediate family, but we're able to outreach and test uh, those who are around them. And here in San Francisco, we're fortunate because we've come a long way. The fact that we can test any San Franciscan, whether you have insurance or not, as long as you exhibit one symptom of COVID-19 or any essential worker without exhibiting any symptoms, we have definitely come a long way. Uh, so that's an important part of the indicators, as well as making sure we have a sufficient supply of PPE. And yes, believe it or not, we are still talking about challenges with PPE. This is just absolutely uh, unbelievable. Uh, the other indicators that they're looking at, of course, are the hospitalizations, the number of cases, and the number of deaths. And taking all this information, analyzing it every single day to determine which phase we move into as a city. And so every day, I'm like, can we do this? Can we do this? Can we do this? Can we do this? Um, the fact that I had an hour-long fight with Dr. Colfax over delivery and pickup for flowers before Mother's Day, um, 
ought to give you an indication of what I'm pushing for, but I, again, I want to push for it responsibly. And in phase, we're in phase basically, you know, there's four phases we have here. And those four phases are not like every week. They are based on these indicators that I mentioned. And phase one is exactly uh, what we've done already in, you know, making the workplace safe for the essential workers. So that was really about, you know, because we had muni drivers who were getting infected. We had sheriff's deputies and grocery store clerks and and so we've, we've done a lot better in providing them with the resources that they need and getting that under control. Uh, we're in phase two, uh, in the beginning of phase two, and that is um, expanding um, it, opportunities to non, non-essential retail. Uh, well, I mean, my makeup and some of the things I like to buy, they're essential to me. However, they're in the category of non-essential like toys and everything else. Just the, the, the fact that yesterday we were able to announce the ability for our city to open up about 90, almost 95% of retail. So when you think about these neighborhood commercial corridors, like the candle store I go to, the bookshops and you know the toy stores that I know parents wanna go to, like these places that are in your communities, they will be able to uh, open for curbside pickup, which is incredible and I'm so happy for them. So if you have an opportunity to walk away from Amazon for a minute and order uh, something from your local business, um, that is gonna be very, very helpful to them, to their store, to their employees. Now, as they analyze the data, the next phase is as long as we are under that, and Dr. Browner can probably explain this better about that number being under one, which we are, we're at like 0.94, and they use all these indicators to come up with this number of where we need to be, because if it goes higher than that number, it can take off like crazy. And so that's the last thing we wanna see happen. So as long as we see things maintained in that level, then we can go into the next phase. It's phase 2B, which is allowing those retail establishments to do uh, exactly what grocery stores are doing, right? Standing in line and you can, instead of, you know, going to the Gap or Sephora to pick up something or your neighborhood business, you can basically go in only a few people at a time with a few employees and actually shop. And, and, and then the next phase of that is phase three is, Uh, movie theaters, places of worship, hospitality, uh, salons and barbershops. And again, it's all contingent upon the numbers. And and phase four are the highest risk places like the concert venues, the big events, the sports arenas. And so the goal is to take the data, analyze it based on those six indicators and allow the city to move in these phases with an understanding that things could also change based on what happens with the numbers. Because the last thing we want is an outbreak that is going to make our numbers surge at a rate that our hospital capacity can't handle. We've been able to flatten the curve. It's not been reduced just yet, but we are at an okay place. And and, and everything depends on the behavior of the people of San Francisco following the order of socially distancing, washing your hands, wearing your mask when necessary based on the requirements and following the order because that will allow this number to continue to go down. And that would give us more opportunity to do more to allow uh, much more to be available um, as we uh, transition back into somewhat of a familiar lifestyle living under the umbrella of COVID-19. So I hope that gives you a a clear picture as to what we can expect. I can't give you any dates. Um, I can't say in June, this is what's gonna happen or this isn't gonna happen, but this is really the plan that we have laid out to give people an understanding of what we need to accomplish to get to a better place. Um, Dr. Brown, do you have a, a, a few words for us on change management, which you were both dealing with this changing over time and, and this idea that maybe it's not one directional. Maybe we're going to be, maybe we're going to be doing uh, a bit of the dance. Uh, and then I know we'll come, Mayor Breen, I know that you have to leave, uh, leave us in just a few minutes. So we'll come back to you for some final thoughts after. Uh, and I will say, if you don't mind, cause I know that you're getting quite a few questions on the chat. 
Um, I don't know if you're able to save them and get them to me and my staff, but we want to be able to respond because we know people have a lot of questions and it is so important that we get folks information as quickly as we can uh, because there's so much uncertainty out there. So we want to be uh, as responsive as we can with the information that you all need. Thank you so much. Dr. Banner, a few words before we let the mayor sign off. Sure. So I think you're seeing the, the mark of a, of, a, of a strong leader, um, uh, someone who listens to her, or I guess his staff, and who surrounds herself with really thoughtful, considerate people. You know, I've had the opportunity to work with Dr. Colfax, Dr. Aragon, Dr. Ehrlich, Dr. Philip, the leadership of the Department of Public Health. And they really do have our best interests at heart. Um, and they have obviously have the ear of the mayor and it's making a difference for all of us. Um, you know, we're living, this is an epochal time. I mean, I just finished reading Camus' The Plague and it's almost like we're living in a novel. This is an event that's gonna change the history of the entire world. Um, we've never seen something that has affected people all over the globe at the same time in almost precisely the same way. And so change management is an interesting term because we're all changing as a result of COVID on our own. And I don't know that it's so much change management from the top as it is change management from the bottom. As we all recognize, we have new obligations. We have to keep ourselves healthy but also, and really importantly, by keeping ourselves healthy, we keep our community healthy, which in turn makes sure that we get to stay healthy. And so there's this virtuous cycle that all the things that we're doing, as hard as they are, are not only helping us, but they're really helping everybody else around us. And it's critical we keep doing it. And even if you see people who aren't, um, feel good about what you yourself are doing because as the mayor pointed out, as long as the city can keep the transmission rate, that famous R naught, below one, very slowly and surely the number of cases in the city will go down. And the more it continues to go down as we open up the city, the more we'll be able to open it up even more. So it's, it's you know, we might be we might be able to do much better than it currently looks like. But I think as we're all aware, there is still remains the possibility that we'll discover that some decision we made, um, whether it's, I don't know, um, deciding that we should all go to the grocery store more than once a week, turns out not to have been such a good idea and we need to walk that back. Mayor Breed, I know you have pressing business to attend to, um, and you've been very gracious with your time. We're going to continue with Dr. Browner for a few more minutes after you leave, but I wanted to give you the opportunity for any closing, any closing uh, remarks for your, for your audience and, and our deep gratitude. Well, um, first of all, again, I want to thank you for uh, the opportunity. Um, and again, just uh, express to people because I know that the chat is still going and people have some burning questions. Uh, about some of the challenges that they face. And, and I really wanna make sure that we, we respond to people because uh, we are in this together and it's, it's really important that we do everything we can to support one another, um, uplift one another and make sure that we get information out there so that people have hope. Um, you know, this, this is with us and this is hard, but it's not gonna be with us forever. Uh, it is a tough time right now and San Francisco is an incredible uh, city. It's a resilient city. Uh, and we know the history of what's happened here. A uh, hundred years ago during the Spanish flu, when we made the mistake, uh, and Dr. Brown, I'm sure is very familiar with, with this in history, but we made the mistake of you know, closing down initially, the churches, the schools and everything else. And two months later, opening up and, and seeing the the numbers surge again and, and countless people uh, lose their lives. And so uh, in the 89 earthquake during the AIDS epidemic, you know, San Francisco has persevered and come out uh, a more stronger, a more resilient city. And I will say that as a result of many of the challenges that we had to deal with, without in some cases, especially during the AIDS crisis, 
a lot of uh, federal support, it made us, uh, it equipped us to handle a pandemic of this magnitude better than most cities. And so we, we want to keep that perspective in mind as we're dealing with this challenge. This is going to make us a better, a, a stronger, a more resilient city. Uh, it's because of the people of this city, and we're going to get through this. Uh, and so uh, I want to thank everyone who's a part of this call and, 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 and our people and San, people throughout San Francisco for their patience and understanding and all that they've done to get us to this point because you know, I may have uh, started uh, the declaration of emergency and, and the shutdown of the city, but I couldn't do this unless people uh, supported it. And, and because of your actions and because of your respect for the directive, we are in a better place. Uh, so again, thank you for this opportunity. Um, I hope we get a copy of the questions so we can respond to each and every one of them. Uh, Dr. Browner, it's good to see you. Uh, thank you for your work and your leadership on the front lines. Uh, please give my regards to your team and the folks who are doing the hard work every single day. We are grateful for, for your service. Uh, and thank you again for having me. Thank you, Mary Breed. Be well. Dr. Browner, if, you're, if you don't mind staying on, there's, there's one additional topic that's sort of come up that we didn't get a chance to hear from you about, which, which really is around, around testing and yeah. around the not just the PCR testing for the for the virus itself, but all of the uncert all of the conversation about what ways antibody testing might be um, a path to a, a faster path to reemerging um, from this this particular portion of the crisis. Anything Thanks, Dorothy. So I've been a physician forty years, and I've never had as many people want to have a positive test as with the COVID antibody test. It's, it's the most desired test result in the history of tests, I think. Um, so let me talk a little bit about the antibodies. Um, they are gonna become available to be tested and the vast majority of us are gonna be negative. So please don't go in expecting that because you had a fever or a cold, or even if you couldn't smell sometime in March or late February that you're going to turn out to have had COVID and have antibodies, that isn't going to be the case. How do I know that? Because of the people who came to our emergency rooms in San Francisco at the height of the pandemic, the vast majority of them, even though we were only testing people who had symptoms and fever or a history of travel or exposure, the vast majority of them were negative they had something else. And right now the testing rates, when we test people for the virus in San Francisco, when they come into centers are less than 5%. And that's of the people who are worried they have the virus. And most of us um, don't think we ever got it. So the first thing to realize is most of us are gonna be antibody negative. The second is many of the antibody tests that are on the market are not particularly worthwhile. Um, and so we'll have better tests, I think, in the next couple of weeks, perhaps months, that'll be more reliable. But they're going to be most useful in identifying people who are potential donors of convalescent plasma. So these are people who were infected, developed, who were infected, developed antibodies, and we can use those antibodies to help treat people who are currently infected and very ill. Um, I worry a lot, and, and so does the public health department, about using antibody testing that if you have a positive test, it's like a get out of jail free card, um, that it entitles you to do something. Um, in part because we don't want anybody trying to get infected so that they can get antibodies. That's a really bad idea. And in part because we don't even yet know whether a positive antibody test means that you will never get reinfected or that you're immune. So antibody testing is not going to be all that useful, I don't think, on an individual basis. It'll be very helpful in understanding where the pandemic has been. So I'm gonna bore you a little bit with some statistics, but I think it's important for people in San Francisco to understand this. So the rates of, of COVID infection in San Francisco in general 
are 10 to 15 times lower than the rates in New York City. Well, that's a really good thing, and that explains why we haven't had the overwhelmed hospital that they've seen, hospitals that they've seen in New York. But if you actually look, and the Department of Public Health has this up on their website, if you look at the distribution of positive tests by zip code, you see something very interesting, which is that in the north and the west of the city, the rates of COVID infection are one eighth the rates in the south and the east of the city. So the rates are extraordinarily low in the Richmond and the Sunset in Pacific Heights and much, much higher in the Mission and in Bayview. And that's where our efforts as a city really need to be to do more testing because the object we're in now, now that we have better control of the epidemic is to find as many positive people as we can and help them to isolate and quarantine themselves so that they don't have the opportunity <clears throat> to inadvertently infect anyone else. And that's what contact tracing is all about. <clears throat> and that's part of the reason why it's still really important not to contact a lot of people. Think about how hard it is to remember what you had for lunch three days ago. Now imagine if you were back to regular life and you had to report everybody you'd come in contact with for the last 10 days. It's much easier to do if the only people you've seen are your spouse or your child or perhaps one or two merchants that you went to see. It's almost impossible to do if we actually resume normal life. So testing and contact tracing is going to be most useful from a public health standpoint to continue to quell the epidemic, get the number of cases down, which as I said earlier, is gonna make it safer for all of us. So it's really a public health strategy at least as much as it's an individual strategy. So help us envision or create the postcard of what this looks like, Dr. Browner, when some schools reopen, when some more activity is happening. Do you imagine that people are being tested either for the antibodies or for the vi presence of the virus itself on their way into school, on their way into a business? Um, do, you, do you think that uh, that workers in a grocery store, preschool teachers, you know, are going to be part of an ongoing testing regime? So we're already doing that in the highest risk environments. So we're already testing everybody in skilled nursing facilities and in prisons, at least here in the Bay Area. And we're test trying to test as many homeless people as we can and people in congregate living. And my best guess is that if the schools are to reopen in the fall, in September or in late August, that we will have to institute some form of testing um, in order to make sure that we don't inadvertently re-spark the epidemic. So I do think that's likely to happen. Um, and obviously that's gonna really challenge us because um, pretty much every kid in school starts school on the same day. So my, another guess I would make is that there'll be staggered starts, not just to the time of day kids show up, so they're, they're not all at the front entrance of the school at the same time, but even uh, the time of, of the month that they show up so that we can better control and better manage. Now, that's gonna be tough for a kid who tests positive and can't start. We all remember how excited we were about rejoining school on the first day, but that may be a consequence of what we need to do to protect everybody else. And how does temperature how do temperature checks fit into that uh, that regime? Um, so there's a couple problems with temperature checks. I think we've all learned that um, many people are asymptomatic when they first start carrying the virus. Not that many are asymptomatic throughout the course of the illness, but some are, and probably particularly kids. So temperature checking is good and valuable if it's positive, but not all that helpful if your temperature is normal. And you know we've been doing it at the hospital. So we test every single employee and physician who comes in the hospital every day by checking their temperature. We've been doing this for many, many weeks. Every day we hear about the number of people who turn away uh, because they have a fever and the number could fit in the palm of my hand. 
So we haven't really identified very many people that way, unfortunately. So we are coming to time. Um, and I wanted to give you an opportunity to, uh, I, I can imagine what the message might be, and it, it, it might be masks and outdoors and uh, stay home. But uh, I wanna give you the opportunity for what you would like this community to be able to take away. And what's our part, what's our part in, um, in helping keep your team safe and in keeping, um, keeping the health of San Francisco uh, top of mind? Well, Marcy, I think probably many people on the call have noticed that you're sitting in front of uh, uh, some sort of structure and that right over your head, it says, let your house be open wide. And of course, that's where we want to get to. And um, what I would say is we are going to get there sooner if we are careful. And you're absolutely right. Um, I'm, I believe we're going to be wearing masks for a very long time. Um, I believe we're going to be meeting our friends and family in the out of doors throughout the summer. Um, and I believe until we have a much better handle um, and can almost literally have a list of everybody in the city who's infected with COVID-19, we're going we're gonna to be under restrictions that are difficult to live with. But the magic words there are to live with. Uh, because the, um, the alternative is grim. So, so thank you. That. And let's, I look forward to gathering together. Um, but for now, this kind of togetherness is what we're all going to have to get used to. And I hope, I hope we're all reaching out to people who are more isolated um, and making them feel a part of our families, even if they are not. Thank you so much for the, the, the direct and candid and in, informative uh, discussion, Dr. Browner. I want to thank Mayor Breed, um, who, who left us earlier. At, thanks to the mayor's office, as well as to Sutter Health CPMC for setting this up. Many thanks to the JCCSF uh, team that pulled this together. Um, and I want to take a final moment to thank our first responders, including those in our hospitals, in our clinics, in ambulances and fire stations, in law enforcement and emergency management, all of whom are working so tirelessly to safeguard our own well-being. And uh, one special thank you to, to Dr. Browner. What, what we did not say at the top of this, of this presentation is that he is a former board chair of the Jewish Community Center of San Francisco and led us ably for, uh, for many years. As we say in Jewish tradition, chazak vuruch, may we all be strong and blessed. Be well and thank you for your attention.